as I said, we're thrilled to have Philip Howard here. We actually did an event with him on, um, when he was on his book tour about 15 years ago uh, for The Death of Common Sense, which was really a groundbreaking book. Uh, we did the event actually in the same room, just by total coincidence, um, and we're just thrilled to have him back. Uh, he's the chairman of a group called Common Good, uh, which he founded, and he'll tell you a little more about during his remarks. Uh, he's a prominent New York attorney. Uh, in addition to The Death of Common Sense, he wrote a book last year called Life Without Lawyers, um, which we'll talk a little bit about why that would be a, a, a good, good thing. Um, CNN has referred to him as one of the most important 10 people that are under the radar in the United States. Um, he writes extensively for the Wall Street Journal. He's on major television programs, including Oprah. Uh, he was an advisor to Vice President Gore, uh, and also several um, candidates during the 2008 election. Um, so he's, he's a fantastic, um, prominent person on these issues, and we're thrilled to have him with us today. Philip Howard. Um, uh, thank you, Dan. Do you want me to use this button, mic, or should I? It's working. It's, it's, it's working. Yeah, it's working. I just have to hold it. Um, okay. Well, what I thought I would do, um, and I'll try to do it briefly, is describe some structural problems that I see in American society that I think have corroded the conditions for human accomplishment. They say government is functional, schools unmanageable, health care unaffordable, and people generally feeling powerless and, and pretty miserable about our, their place in our society. Uh, uh, I think there is a solution to this, but it involves major structural overhaul. And the solution basically is aimed at restoring the conditions for individual responsibility. We all know that nothing good happens unless an individual take, takes responsibility. We know it in our own lives. Nothing good happens because you dutifully followed the rule or filled out the form properly or checked the right box. Something happens because you put your heart and soul into it. And it's true whether you're making a sale in a business, writing a good brief as a lawyer, uh, being an inventor in one of the high-tech companies, or coaching a little league team. It's, it's the same in all human endeavor. It's people really putting themselves into it and trying hard and doing what it takes to make it work, taking responsibility that <clears throat> makes anything work. And that's the sort of the founding character of our country. That's the basis of the can-do culture of America. It's the, um, it's the, it's the, um, I think Thomas Edison had this wonderful phrase uh, that, that described it. He said, nothing that's any good works by itself. You've got to make the damn thing work. And, and, and that's, again, it's true in all life and ever. And that's the concept that Barack Obama inspired the country with in the 2008 election, with the campaign slogan, Yes, We Can. This idea that we can all come together and, and, and make things happen. But if you visit American schools, hospitals, business, community centers, read the pew polls, but look at what's happening in America, the dominant message is not, yes, we can, but no, you can't. It's true throughout our society. Again, this has been surveyed extensively. The people no longer feel able to to do what they think is right. They don't think they can put their their arms and their their arms around the problem and actually tackle it and make it happen. And the reason is a legal structure that's pressed down into daily choices. We think now that we can calibrate fairness and correctness in each and every human endeavor. And so we have an uh, idea of lawsuits that if anything you think is unfair, anyone can bring a claim for virtually anything and drag someone else into court for, for years. We have the idea that we can, if we want to regulate something, we should do it with detailed rules. So many rules that in the federal government now, there are a hundred million words in binding federal law and rules. So many rules that no one could know them all. And that's this idea that somehow you can instruct people that law should be a software program where the correctness will be di dictated if only we can get the legal system exactly correct. And what I argue in, in my books is that this isn't freedom, it's the opposite of freedom. 
is, is actually remove the conditions uh, for, for freedom and accomplishment in this society. The land of the free has become a kind of legal minefield. And, you know, people have been complaining about the lawsuit part of it for a couple of decades, tort reformers and such, and there are these ridiculous lawsuits that you read about, like the lawyer in the Washington, D.C., who sued his dry cleaners for $54 million because they lost a pair of pants, which is reasonable. Um, and, and the lawsuit goes on for a couple of years and finally goes to trial, and he predictably loses, loses the lawsuit. But the truth is, if you added up all the litigation in the country and what the direct cost of it is, it's not that much. Our tort system costs maybe twice as much as other countries, but that's at most 1% of GDP, and not enough to cripple the country. The total cost of malpractice, litigation, insurance, the whole, whole works is about $35 billion a year, which is maybe 1.5% of the health care bill. The direct costs are not what make health care so unaffordable. But what this intrusion of law and the daily choices has done is it's changed the culture so that people no longer actually feel able to make sense of their daily lives. So in healthcare, for example, defensive medicine, the practice of ordering tests that aren't really needed, is pervasive because doctors universally don't trust the system of justice. It's hard to measure because there are mixed motives. Sometimes doctors make more money on it, but reliable estimates say defensive medicine is 60 to $200 billion a year. That's enough money to pay for health insurance for everybody who doesn't have it, just right there. And all you need to do is create a system of justice that's actually trustworthy and reliable. The trial lawyers say that the system of justice makes doctors practice better medicine. That's been studied by the Institute of Medicine, among others. That's not true. The fear of justice prevents doctors, it chills professional interaction so that doctors no longer speak up and say, are you sure that's the right dosage? Because they don't want to take legal responsibility. So thousands of tragic errors occur because of distrust of the legal system. Schools, we were talking about this last night at the reception, the schools have been transformed by law. Uh, you could, it's a section of the law library for each of the following concepts, due process, special education, no child left behind, zero tolerance, work rules, um, tenure. You, you can't do anything in a school without p putting your nose in the rule book and possibly suffering through a um, through a legal process. I was hiking in, in Wyoming a couple of years ago, and a guy was a local science teacher. I told her I was a lawyer. She hated lawyers. She uh, started, the story started coming out. She was being threatened with a lawsuit by a parent because she lowered the grade of a child by 10%, turned the paper in late, which was a rule in the class. And the principal wouldn't stand up for it because he didn't have the time to go to a legal proceeding. And eventually, after 30 days of meetings of sleepless nights, she gave up. At the same time, she wanted to take two students to a, a leadership conference in Laramie a couple of hours away. She was going to drive them in her car and said, no, you can't do that because of liability reasons. So the school provided a school bus that held 60 people, which drove the three of them back and forth to Laramie. About the same time, her husband, also a science teacher, uh, was going to go on a hike with his class, but one of the child, one of the children in the class was disabled, and he was told he couldn't go for a nature hike in a biology class because one of the children couldn't go and it would violate her rights. You think about then those sorts of decisions all day long, none of which make make any sense. The worst thing in schools is the decline of order. Um, Forty-three percent of high school teachers say they spend more time maintaining order than teaching. That means the kids in that class don't get uh, the education they're supposed to get. Why is that? Because of the rise of due process. Students no longer think teachers have authority, and teachers no longer think they have authority to maintain order. Uh, we surveyed this. It turned out that 78% of the teachers have been sued, I mean, have been, have been threatened by their students with lawsuits. Think about what that says about the change in the culture. And it's not that most sue or would win if they did sue, it's a reflection of the fact that no one has the authority left to, to, to run a classroom. Officials no longer have authority. 
President Obama comes to town on this great scheme of public opinion and immediately gets stuck in the goo. He can't do anything. They passed a stimulus package to weatherproof, five, allocated $5 billion to weatherproof 590,000 homes. A year later, none of the money's been spent, or most, most of the money hasn't been spent, because it turns out there was a law passed in 1931, signed by President Hoover, that requires that for construction projects funded in part with federal money, that the wages for each job category be set as a matter of law in each of 3,000 different counties. So Tacoma, Elko, Nevada, Monmouth County, New Jersey. This makes central planning look efficient. For, so for the last year, hundreds of bureaucrats have been trying to set the wages for weatherproofers in 3,000 different counties. Um, there's, um, we have a budgetary crisis in many states. Can't balance the budget. Well, why is that? We can't balance the budget because of politicians 10 and 20 years ago made promises which were then put into law that the current legislators can't undo for political as well as other reasons because they're in the law. So most of the budget's already been spent. And every year, every new promise by the legislature gets adds up like sediment in the harbor until there's very little discretionary money's left to meet today's needs. And the current political leaders don't have the authority to balance these different interests against each other. So we've created a democracy where basically it's ruled by dead people. It's people who were elected 20 years ago and no longer 30 years ago and no longer with us, or President Hoover. And, and it requires a majority of Congress or a majority of the legislature to change every nut and bolt of that law. And they're not even talking about it. And so what do you do? Democracy is like a one-way ratchet. You can add more things. You can add a health care bill that does universal care, which I think is a good idea. But no one even talks about going back and realigning Medicare so that there are actually incentives by patients and doctors to be prudent in their use of health care expenditures. Well, you're never going to control health care costs unless you do that. You have to change it. But there are all these armies of special interest around each one of those entitlements, and, and so Congress won't even have, have the discussion. And we think this is just a problem of government. It's not a problem of government. It, it ripples out to all of society. People are acting like idiots all day long. Broward County, Florida, a couple of years ago, banned running at recess because they had 186 claims for parents when kids fell down and broke their leg at recess. When kids run around, accidents happen. doesn't mean there should be a legal claim. So who's drawing those boundaries? Nobody. Um, it's the rule in America you can't put an arm around a crying child. We'll protect you if somebody says it was an unwanted touch. There are warning labels on every product. You know, call you, Starbucks, caution, contents are extremely hot. You know, uh, archaeologists will dig us up and think it was an aphrodisiac. Because no one would be stupid enough to warn against a self-evident condition like a hot liquid. You feel it. Um, so what's happening? So in all these places, healthcare, schools, the government, no one feels like they have the authority to do what's right. They know what's right to do, but they can't do it. They feel uncomfortable. There's so many rules that you can't possibly know them all, and any time there's a disagreement, somebody unilaterally can haul you into this horrible proceeding. A doctor friend of mine, a pediatrician, said, I don't deal with patients the same way anymore. You wouldn't want to say something off the cuff that might be used against you. Imagine going through the day as a doctor Life is spent taking care of people, thinking that way, like there's a little lawyer on his shoulder, whispering in his ear all day long, mm, you better not say something, you better not say the child looks well, because that might be used against you in case the child turns out to be sick. And, and it's actually changed the way people think. So what, one of the most interesting parts to me of, of, of doing the research for this new book, Life Without Lawyers, was, was uh, looking into the cognitive uh, processes by which people accomplish things. It turns out people don't accomplish things by making 
as I said, by making lists or by calculating and being logical. It's actually intelligence that's in that dark, deep well of the brain where, uh, of subconscious, where you have instinct and experience and accumulated learning, evolutionary factors, judgment, and you, and people, experts say, disappear into the task. They're actually not even thinking about solving the problem. They are solving the problem. That's what happens if you're a writer, if you're doing anything. You're dealing with another person. You're not thinking about how you're dealing with them. You're, you're making it happen. So what happens if you make them self-conscious is you make them fail. It drives people from the smart part of the brain to the thin veneer of conscious logic. Logic. So pretty soon the doctor is saying, well, I doubt if that headache's a tumor, but who will protect me in the off chance that it, that it is, so maybe I better order the MRI just to be safe. And pretty soon you've wasted $200 billion in unnecessary tests because you've changed the way people think. The teacher says, well, I know Johnny threw the pencil and he's the one disrupting the class, but how will I really prove that he did it if the parents make me go to the hearing? And pretty soon the teacher's lost control. Of the, of, of the classroom. Self-consciousness, particularly about law, which involves state power and stuff, makes people fail. A pianist can't play the piece if she's thinking about how she's hitting the notes. You have to, a free society, a can-do society, is about people focusing on solutions, not focusing on protecting themselves. So what is the solution? We have to restore a legal framework that people trust. So instead of trying to calibrate each decision, we have to pull law back into a framework where it actually sets the not tells everybody what to do all day long, but sets the boundaries of what's unreasonable. That's what law is about. And law, actually, freedom has a formal structure in law. And the structure is this. Law sets boundaries. And on one side of the boundaries are the things you must do or you can't do. You gotta pay your taxes, you can't drive unreasonably, that's right. But those same boundaries are supposed to define and affirmatively protect a dry ground of freedom where you can do whatever you want. You can be obnoxious, you can not show up to work on time, and all that sort of stuff. You won't be unaccountable, you just won't be accountable by law. People will say, well, you're a jerk, you're fired. That's that's, what, that's why law is the foundation of freedom, because it sets those boundaries and it protects you from, from that. Those dikes have burst. People wade through law all day long. There is hardly any social interaction in America that is free of legal consequence. So we have people tiptoeing through the day looking over their shoulder instead of focusing on their job. So what do we need? Well, we need Regulation to be pulled back, not to quote deregulate, you need regulation in a crowded, anonymous society. You, how do I know whether it's lead paint on the toys or pollution in the rivers? Somebody has to be looking after those, those, um, those issues. But lawsuits should be actually, somebody has to draw lines as a matter of law. Because what someone sues for, there's no right to sue, that's what the trial lawyers say. What someone sues for establishes the boundaries of everyone else's freedom. If somebody sues because the kid fell off the seesaw, it doesn't matter what the jury does. Just the possibility of a lawsuit will mean that all the seesaws will disappear, which is what's happened. There are no seesaws left in America, or jungle gyms, or climbing ropes, or merry-go-rounds, or anything that would attract a kid over the age of five to the playground, because all of those things involve actually motion and risk and things that there are accidents, but they also attract kids to come to, to get exercise and take responsibility for themselves and such. So you have to draw boundaries. So we have concrete programs at Common Good, this group I found in healthcare. We have a coalition that includes basically everybody in healthcare, including consumer groups and everyone else, behind the idea of abandoning the system of justice and creating expert health courts, no juries, that would make written rulings as a matter of law be much quicker for whoever's right to um, um, to decide malpractice cases. And the goal there is not to prevent lawsuits, or to have to be more lawsuits, but to create a system that doctors can trust so that actually we can start managing health care to, to, to save costs. In schools, we have a joint venture between the head of the teachers union 
and several boards of education to redesign the system of discipline so that teachers can take back control of the classroom. But ultimately, doing any of these reforms, and Obama actually came out for our health board proposal in March. The Congress has still been bought off by the trial lawyers, but it, it will happen. But ultimately, these, these problems can't be solved by doing this reform or that reform. You can't prune the jungle. You can clear out an area of the jungle, and that's an improvement. But no one's going to generalize and fix all these other problems, some of the ones you just heard about before I got up. So I think fundamentally what's required, and I've become radicalized by the healthcare debate and how bad it was, is that we're going to have to have a movement. The Tea Party is absolutely right. The government's broken. They're wrong in their solutions. You actually don't want to disempower judges and officials. You want to give them more authority and have more accountability. You want to be able to really shine the spotlight on people where they're making decisions. But you have to have people actually drawing these boundaries of law and enforcing these boundaries to, to protect a, a, a free society. And the movement, I think, should be one where the first principle is we have to overhaul the whole system. There's too much sediment in the harbor. Nobody can get anywhere anymore. It's just piled up for 200 years. Our founders never anticipated this. It's, they never anticipated that there would be so much law combined with checks and balances that you can't undo any of the, the law. So you can't, so you have all these dead people running the country through their laws. I actually had a long journalist, uh, a journalist from Moscow called me today, we had a long interview. He said, we don't have enough law. And you say you have too much law. What's the, how do you reconcile these things? I said, well, they actually have the same effect. If you don't have enough law, you have a, terror, a tyrant, and you have arbitrariness, and people are fearful, and they can't accomplish things because they're fearful. And if you have too much law, it's like having a dead tyrant. People, people feel fearful because they don't know all the law. They might be breaking the rules. And in this case, in America, we let anybody who doesn't like something drag you into court. So that's a form of tyranny, too. So the mean is to draw it back and create something that people generally understand that accords with social norms. And the way to do that is to clean out the system based on a governing principle, I believe, of individual responsibility. So, how is the patient responsible for prudent use of healthcare resources? Does the teacher have authority to run the classroom? Can she, can she take responsibility to run the classroom? Go through each and every issue in our society and remake it, as someone was saying, starting with a blank piece of paper. And if we don't do that, we're going to get stuck further and further in this goo, just like President Obama's gotten stuck in it. So did George Bush before him, and these is, these this movement won't come out of Washington, won't come out of our state or, or national capitals. It's going to come out of groups like this around the country, the Washington Policy Center and its allies getting together, not for partisan reasons, not for conservative or liberal causes, but to remake it because the current system is one where everyone has been rendered powerless. And I think we have to wake up to the reality of the fact that our government is broken. And it requires a constructive solution, not just new people. The, you know, the Tea Party thinks you can throw the bumps out and it'll be fixed. No, it won't, because all that law is still there. All those rules, thousands of pages of rules for schools, et cetera, are still there. So it's, I think it's a very exciting time. It's a very exciting time for the Washington Policy Center not only because of all the concrete things it's doing, but because it's groups like this that will be essential to leading the change that our country needs to make it both competitive and to restore the can-do spirit that made this country great. Thank you very much. <laughs>